Oh, except for the mic. <laughs> so anyway, uh, this particular area is really a significant area. And one of the reasons it is, it's one of the two national landmarks in our area. And the other one is Bald Head Island. And so these are really significant areas. And just to let you know, we have a movement afoot to try to designate part of the Black River as a national landmark area as well. I think you all understand why we would want that. And so in looking at this area, it really is quite a special area. I've been to quite a few places uh, in my short life. And uh, so this is one of the top places actually to actually go in the United States or the world. People come here from all over the world to see the Green Swamp. It really is that special. And what I'd like to do today is tell you a few things about some of the areas that we've looked at over the last 20 or so years with the Nature Conservancy in doing some field studies to look at longleaf in particular for restoration and management. Also for that yellow plant that you see over there, that's called Lismachia spirulifolia. It's an endangered species. And then of course our own iconic Venus flytrap as well. And I would like to highlight that there's a lot of people that work here, but of special note is my wife, <laughs> Dale. <laughs> and uh, Dale's been doing this work for a, a long time. Uh, we both have, and of course to our local Nature Conservancy guys in the Southeast Coastal Plain office, headed by Deb Maurer, but also Zach West and Nathan Brester and Michelle Lee have all done you know, yeoman's work in this area to make sure it's maintained as well as other areas uh, in the southeastern coastal plain. Oh, and by the way, that down there that you see, the state toast. So when you guys get out today and in the afternoon have your favorite beverage, you can say a toast <laughs> to the land of the longleaf pine. So I want to run through a couple of things today with you, a uh, little history on the area. Uh, also the importance of fire, obviously, and I'm going to mention some of the things from last year's wildfire as well, because I think all of you know about that a little bit. Uh, so the setting of the area, and then very briefly, <laughs> because we could be here all day, and there's other things to do, such as the studies that we've actually done just show you a few examples of what we're looking at on longleaf pine, the Lismachia, and also the Venus flytrap. So the first thing I always like to do is have a map. You know, geologists love maps. <laughs> and maps are really a critical element of anything that you do to show change over time. And this particular map kind of shows that. And what it's showing is this dotted area is all the distribution of the longleaf pine historically. And then you kind of see these little greenish areas? Well, those are actually what's left today. So from the time the colonists arrived in the United States with 90 million acres of longleaf pine, by 2000 we were down to about 3 million acres. It's a globally endangered ecosystem. And so one of the things that's been going over, on over the years is to try now in the past two decades to reestablish some of these areas. And there's a movement to try to do that with Nature Conservancy, the Longleaf Alliance, and others. So where we're going to focus in is in this area right there in what's called the Green Swamp. So you might notice that map I just showed you. That kind of coincides with that map, doesn't it? That's the 36 biodiversity hotspot, a globally recognized area from 2016. And it's recognized as a global diversity hotspot simply because it has so many endemic species to it that it's a critical area to try and maintain. And if you just look in Brunswick County, over 400 different species are in Bullen Springs and the Green Swamp. So it has a lot of endemics too, which means they're only in this area, okay? And of course, this is a place we're gonna be. This is Shoestring Savannah down in the Green Swamp. So what are we doing now? Well, starting in 2009, there was a movement afoot to say, this is kind of ridiculous. We need to reestablish some of these longleaf pines. And so there was a push then in 2009 with a report to say, 
by 2025, we want to have 8 million acres of longleaf pine. Very lofty goal. Well, we're not going to make that. But right now, we are up to 5.2 million acres. So 2.2 million acres have been added since 2009. So what's now happening is the new report from the group from 2025 to 40. This is saying that by 2040, we will certainly reach 8 million. And if we get more than that, that's fantastic, but that's kind of the goal. And so if we can do that, then you know, we're having some success. And you can see here, the goal is to maintain, improve, and restore. And I might add a little note that you guys, I hope you'll send a thank you note to the governor because just in the past week, you might have heard about his executive order 305 that looks to both establish a new million acres of wetland areas to restore a million acres of wetland areas and to plant over a million trees in North Carolina. So this is one of the biggest things I think that he's done. Executive Order 80, which was the one that talked about renewable energy and others, but this 305, this is huge, particularly in the face of the ruling of the Supreme Court of Sackett versus EPA that basically did away with protections of wetlands. You're going to see Pocosins, which are wetlands in this. Those are really important ones that the governor has put in Executive Order 305 to say we need to protect those. So we oftentimes complain and we write nasty letters like I do sometimes, <laughs> but sometimes you need to write those thank you notes as well to make sure we continue to do those good things. So what did happen? Well, some of you have heard about this fellow, William Bartram, tooled around South Carolina, North Carolina, and other places. And way back then in 1789, said that we find ourselves on the entrance of a vast plain extending 60 or 70 miles mostly of longleaf pine. The whole idea is you could walk for 70 miles and you'd still be in longleaf pine. Fast forward, 1932. This is B.W. Wells, who is a botanist ecologist at NC State, or was. You might have heard of Wells Savannah. That was named for this guy. And so in looking at this, he said not one part of that natural wonder remains intact because of feral hogs, turpentining you know, the naval stores, or cutting down and burning up that legacy of American history. And truly, the Longleaf Pine was the tree that built the South. And if you ever want to read a really good book uh, called Looking for Longleaf, it describes the history of the Longleaf Pine, naval stores, and many other things. So in looking at these, why did we have all this biodiversity loss? Well, it turns out that we've recognized this for a long time, and it's a thing called the IUCN Red List. They identify the stressors that lead to biodiversity loss. Anybody want to guess at what the top one is? Man, right? Human, <laughs> Human activity. Well, it turns out the three that are the most important are these three overexploitation, agriculture. Now, agriculture includes silviculture, which is forestry as well, okay, pine plantations, and then urban development. Those are the top three that you've got. If you look at this, there you can see some of the overexploitation. In this, this is using naval stores to caulk the wooden ships, and this is taking some of that tar and resin and distilling it to go into turpentine. And of course, this overexploitation of wood and wood products, and this is the naval stores, actually required you know, the work of many enslaved people in our area. And without the enslaved labor, because this is really backbreaking work, where you notch the trees, you put in tar kilns and others, and then that resin is taken at that time transported to Wilmington, which was the naval store's export capital of the world in the 17 and early 1800s. There was more naval stores that went out of Wilmington than any other place in the world, even on the New York Stock Exchange, by the way. 
And that though by 1860s, as we were moving from the wooden to the, you know, the steel hulled vessels, but also, you know, the change following the Civil War, you didn't have the enslaved labor uh, anymore. But this industry continued on into the early 1900s, just on a really reduced, you know, manner. We have multiple ones. If you want to see them sometime, you just come over to UNCW. We've got two tar kilns and 16 notch trees on our campus. That's part of that history of naval stores. And then this is agriculture. We're going to be looking at the Green Swamp Preserve right there. And you see all those little squares? All that's pine plantations. And it's the same thing that you see here. And so all these little squares, this area has been cut. This is what we call a false color infrared map. So the redder it is, the more vegetation. So these were cut recently. These are now planted and starting to grow, and then these are mature ones. So they're going to harvest those at like 30 to 40 years of time. And fortunately, this is a good thing that you don't harvest everything at once. Even though this is a monoculture, you know, this gives an opportunity for some of the critters and others to actually move to these areas when you cut these things out. But look at this picture. There's Lake Waccamaw in Columbus County, and you see that line. And some of you know me say, know that I always say that if you see a straight line in nature, nature didn't do it. <laughs> and so humans did this. And so what they were doing was going in and ditching and roading so that you could actually lower the water table so that the pine plantations could be put in. And you might notice by 1990, look at the area. And you see this? That's the green swamp. And then, of course, I don't have to tell you how fast we're growing around here, but I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> Because it's worth saying that Brunswick County is the fastest growing county in the state. Johnston County displaced us for a year, but we're back on top. <laughs> and it's actually in the top 10 in the country. Pender County is actually number eight in North Carolina, too. And so when you look at this, the census report says how fast these guys are going. And these other ones, except for Currituck, are all around Raleigh or where? Charlotte, okay? So, here's my toast again. Here's to the land of the longleaf pine. Well, this is what's happening in a lot of our area. And a lot of us have been pushing back on this because this is absolutely crazy, in my opinion. Whenever you're doing something like this, it turns out that if you look at the economics, you'll get a much higher return on investment if you leave some of the natural area behind. It also protects, you know, the stormwater, the flooding, and others. Just go to Magnolia Greens, go to Brunswick Forest, go to North Chase. You have a big rainfall event. I promise you this morning, some of those roads had water on them, pretty much. And the other thing in clear cutting is they had to burn the wood. What a waste. There's actually things that you could do, such as biochar, to actually, you know, preserve some of that material, then use it to amend the soil, as well as to use for, you know, carbon capture, too. Why burn it and let it go to the atmosphere? It's, so both should be banned, in my opinion. So anyway, what's the current stressors? Well, the current stressors are development, as I just showed, but the other one is fire suppression. Longleaf pines are a, what we call a pyroclimax community or fire dependent community and without it it's not going to be healthy may not even survive so we have to have fire for the longleaf and one of the things that we look at with that I wanted to show you how a fire actually goes I'm going to show you a series of pictures this is in Big Island which is one of the savannas in the green swamp this picture was taken before the burn, January 14th of 2021. The burn occurred a month later, and then we took pictures right after that. So this next one is, you know, as you can see there, a little over two weeks passed. So there's, there's the burn. There's another month that's passed by, and another month, and another month. 
and you can see the recovery that's there. But I want to show you one more. People say we don't have fall colors around here. <laughs> well, they're wrong. Here's a picture following a burn that was done in May of this past year. This is the same area, by the way, those two trees. Recognize my trees? <laughs> Look at this grass. And by the way, if you got any dental problems today, <laughs> this one is called toothache grass. And honestly, you can chew that, it will numb your gum, okay? So just go down and use the natural products. <laughs> okay, so what happens to this whenever we have move into fall? Now, my wife isn't tall, <laughs> but she's 5'2". Look how tall that grass is. This was an amazing burn. This is just really incredible to see. And of course, if you don't have burns, you don't have these. These are all wildflowers down in the swamp. All picture we took you know, over the months because it changes all the way from April to November. Every month you go down there, you see something different. It's never the same. You gotta love it. And all of these are ones, and then we also have our, whoops, our carnivorous plants. All of these are carnivorous plants. We got our pitcher plants, we got our sundews and butterworts, even a bladderwort. This one's the one that's in the water, that captures it in the water. So all of these things would not be there without fire. And what about a bad fire? <laughs> so this particular picture, fire in this area, and you can see the smoke coming off over there. You can see it from space. And last summer, I'm sure if some of you were here, you had the smoke and the ash come in on you here in Wilmington from that fire. You can see the air quality. By the way, this is why you shouldn't burn either. <laughs> because of the air quality, the stuff that's being put in there. But anyway, this fire kind of got wild. The Resources Commission was doing a controlled burn, and it turned out what happened was they went away for the night and came back the next day. There had bitten some of the ashes or embers had gotten over into Nature Conservancy area, and it reignited. And once it was in that Pocosin area, then it was kind of lights out for the area to try to put it out. So the decision was to go in. There's where it started. There's the outline of the green swamp. So what they said was to keep this fire from moving into some of these other more sensitive areas. They worked with the Nature Conservancy and the Forest Service to say, well, what we're going to do to control this is we're going to establish the green swamp proper. By the way, the green swamp covers a huge area of Brunswick County. This is what we call just Green Swamp Preserve here. That's about 17,000 acres. So what they decided to do was run the fire lines along the edge of the Green Swamp to focus the fire in this area to keep it from going anywhere else. And that tact actually paid off really well. So everybody said, well, what is going to happen to our forest? Just like they said in Yellowstone in 1988, Yellowstone is dead because of that big fire that occurred. But we all know, in looking at that a few years later, how well Yellowstone came back. So this is a picture of it. There's the burn area. I think you can see there's no green left in there. So just look at this about a month later. See the green already starting to come back? So I thought I'd show you a few pictures of what that looks like on the ground. So this is a picture in one of the Pocosin areas. The soil used to be up there before the burn. The soil is now down there, foot and a half to two feet lower. All this was organic soils that burned and basically just kept going away. See all these roots? Those roots don't grow at the surface. <laughs> So those roots are all part of what was burned, all the soil around that area. Now, this Pocosin area that you're looking at, you can see all of the area back here in this higher. Look at all those pines. They're all charred or burned back here, it looks like. This is a month after the burn, 
was contained. And you can see stuff's already coming back. And this picture from January of this year on New Year's Day, my wife and I had our collards and black-eyed peas, and then we went down to the swamp <laughs> so, uh, to celebrate the day that way. And look at these little guys. Those are pond pines starting to come up. The only way you're going to get a pond pine to grow is to burn all that stuff because it's a special kind of tree. It has a cone called a serotonous cone that just holds really tight until it gets a really hot fire. When that hot fire occurs, then it opens up and drops its seed. So this guy has been waiting for 50 years <laughs> to be able to do that. And so this is just a picture to show you what this is. Dale's going to kind of stand there in the same place. This is our photo point. So we take photo points at the major coordinates, north, south, east, west. And so I'm just going to go through. This is the month after it. So higher ground back there where the truck is and lower ground over here. That's in September. That's in October. And that's in November. And that's... New Year's Day. You notice we had Christmas colors. <laughs> so, so all of these are some of these bushes here which are all wetland species. All of this is hydric soils, wetland soils. But I also want you to note, see that yellow back there? Mm -hmm. And look at those trees. You see the brown in there anymore? No. They dropped those needles from the heat and then they have brought more in. So let me show you a picture of that yellow arrow. All this is wiregrass, and wiregrass only will flower and seed if you have fire. All of those are seed heads on that wiregrass. Just an amazing thing, just like wheat blowing out there. So all of that would not have happened if we didn't have that fire. So what have I told you so far? It's a fire-dependent ecosystem, and the Green Swamp is part of that 36th uh, global biodiversity hotspot. We had down to 3 million, but we're back up to 5.2 with a goal of 8. And when it clears up this afternoon, you guys get out in the forest because health guys say it's going to help you out a lot. You're going to feel a lot better standing under a tree. You know, it's got to be better than standing on the street, right? So this is, this is really positive. There's all kinds of stories and actually now truth to say that being in nature actually helps our system. So let's go to the area. There's the Green Swamp Preserve in there. And one of the things that we think a lot about in ecology is to think about connectivity. If you don't have connectivity of natural areas, these car doors we call them, then the biodiversity is greatly reduced. And you can see here the green swamp and the juniper game lands, which is also nature conservancy. We have a really good corridor here going all the way over to Lake Waccamaw and then into the Waccamaw River. That's what we need. We've unfortunately got some barriers to some of these. Holly Shelter that's up here that some of you have probably been to, this is a fantastic area as well. But it's difficult for critters to move all the way around like that. So Nature Conservancy and others have been trying to buy up lands like along the Black River, you know, adjacent to Holly Shelter and others to try to get us to that corridor point. So let me show you something. I'm a geologist, as most of you know. Uh, I love nature. And I wanted to show you something geological, though, that's really important. So if you look at this area, that's Highway 17 going from Wilmington down to Myrtle Beach. This is Highway 211 that you take to go in here to where I take people for, you know, walks in the swamp and also where we do all the work that I'm going to show you. But I want to show you another picture of that. See those white arrows? Keep your eye on the white arrows. So this is what we call a digital elevation map. It shows elevation. And so right there goes from lower elevation to higher elevation. You see that line? That's a line that's 50 feet here and then 62 feet up there. Right there 
was where you would have laid your towel on the beach 700,000 years ago. <laughs> That's the beach. That's the coastline. And this is what we call the scarp, and then this is the terrace on either side. And so what that corresponds to is a change in geology right there. And we have nine different scarps in the coastal plain of North Carolina that has all this changing sea level as we've seen. All right, so what I'm going to show you for the rest of the time is some of the studies that we got. And this box is our destination for today. So all of these areas that you're going to look at are going to be all within this particular area. So the first thing I wanted to quickly show you was some of the longleaf pine work that we've been doing. So you know longleaf pine, again, it's the tree that built the south, but what they ended up doing was taking out a lot of the longleaf and putting in loblolly and slash. In fact, slash is not endemic to this area. It is a southern Georgia, Florida tree that was brought up here to try to improve, you know, the harvest. A shorter time period of what longleaf takes as a longer time, slash would do it in a shorter time to get the same wood product, okay? There's some issues with that I can tell you about later, but for now, let's just say that. And so what we're trying to do is reestablish some longleaf pines in these areas. So we've got these test areas and areas that have been looked at by Nature Conservancy to try and determine, you know, replanting and then how those plants are actually doing in these areas. So the first one, just quickly, I'm just going to show you a snippet of what we're doing. So this is one of the areas called North Myers Clemens. There's Highway 211. And we got these plots, you can see them in there. And these little letters are different soils. The WO is a Woodington soil, and that Woodington soil is a poorly drained soil, it's a hydric soil. This would fit in the wetland category, as we said. The forest and soil is moderately well drained, it is not hydric. So there you got, so what we wanted to do was see what some of the difference would be once you went in and put in your pines to see how well they grow in these areas and restore that particular ecosystem. So we just started monitoring this, so we don't have a lot of data yet, but I just wanted to show you the kind of study. So this is in 2017, so they're going to go in and take out some of those slash and then come over here and replant with longleaf. You see that there's a little bit of an issue there, though. <coughs> it turns out that the logging in this particular case uh, you have to have use this big equipment. I mean, it's giant equipment. Only thing is, sometimes they compact the soil too much in the area. And so, a lot of that area, we're going to monitor it, but that's going to be hard to bring back, simply because of the heavy, heavy truck loads that have pushed that soil down and compacted it. So this is one of the things that we'll actually be looking at. And then this is another area, the same kind of thing, to look at, you know, restoration in those areas. So let me show you one that actually has, you know, long-term data. So this is in 2000, and in 2000 what you got there is they just cut all that trees out because it was scrap wood and all those kinds of things, put in our longleaf. This is three years later. All those are longleaf pines. So I want you to keep your eye on those two white arrows. And this is really the value of long-running data. You just can't go out and do one time. You need to do sequential data to actually have good information. 2006, 2009. So 2009, the same to reference, 12, 18. And then we're going to monitor this plot this year, but we went out after the wildfire to take a picture just to see what it looked like, and those are the same ones that are there. Now, one thing that you might note in all of these, I'm not having a whole lot of other trees come up underneath those long leaves. That's the point of fire, because if you don't have fire, those other trees would actually out-compete those guys. So the data that you look at in this, and this is kind of data that we acquire, so 2006 and 18, we want to see that the grasses are kind of the same. Look at that. Really good. We want to see that some of that understory like turkey oak or you know, blue jack oak or some of these other ones are taken out so that the longleaf thrive too because fire will take out those other trees, not longleaf. And the other thing that you see, 
look at the, we call this DBH, and all it is is diameter breast height. So imagine you know, that's the shape of the tree. You're just measuring the diameter across that, and it's getting bigger and bigger as we go. And so you can see the growth factor that's occurring here. Real small trees, and they're getting bigger and bigger. So our monitoring this year is going to show these moving on down the category. I hope. <laughs> We're pretty confident it will. So that's just a quickie of longleaf. Let me show you some of the things with Lismaki uh, and Venus flytraps. This is our area, all these areas. You see all this dense green? Those are the Pocosins. So of the 16,000, give or take, acres, 13,000 plus of that is Pocosin. But you can see how less dense that is, and there's a blow up of that. That's the wet savanna. This is where all the wildflowers and all that stuff is. So each of these red is a plot for Lismachia, and each of the yellows are our plots for uh, Venus flytraps. So it turns out, this is a really important picture. There's the Pocosin. You gotta get your machete <laughs> you know, to go get through there. I mean, you don't walk through there. It's really, really dense. And the other thing that you see with this is, here's the savanna, so that's two to three feet higher than right there. But look at the change of the world. So this is totally wet, this is somewhat wet, and then we have this magic zone in between we call the ecotone. And the ecotone is a site where we have lots of our carnivorous plants, lots of our wildflowers, and this is the only place where the Lismachia is. Now, Venus flytraps really love this, but they can be out here. They're sparser, but they're still out here, too. Very, very important. And there's the executive order I was telling you about. So, what does the soil look like? This is the soil in the ecotone. Look how dark it is. It's got more organics, it's wetter, and then this is out in the middle of the savanna that's there. So again, there's the ecotone, and this box, this little yellow box, is right there. Can you see the wall? So there's the savanna, there's the Pocosin. That picture is exactly right there. So the soils that we got in here, Forreston is the slightly drier, and over here the Torhunta, which is very wet. All right, so this is the kind of zone where the Lismachia, the endangered species, occurs. This is the flower. Blooms in late May to early June. That's the same time as the flytrap, by the way. And so you can see, see all these kind of plants like that? All of those are Lismachia. This plot, 25 meters, has over 1,000 plants in it, okay? And what we're doing is try to monitor over time to see what will happen within these transects, the numbers, the percent flowering, and all of that. So. Let me just show you two pictures there. This is one of the ones that's been monitored you know, since early 2000s. So there's our transect and there's the quadrat that we use. We lay it out and then you count the plants within that quadrat on your hands and knees, <laughs> okay? And whenever you're doing that, you're counting all these plants, but notice here, you see these shrubs? That's encroachment into the area that's ideal for the Lismachia. That's not a good thing. And so when you have that, that's an issue that we're looking at and thinking about with fire. Are the plants actually moving out of that or are they dying off? So that's what we've been looking at. This is an area you might notice there has no flowers. This area, this is shoestring. This was burned in January of 2023 had good flowering and lots more numbers than what we had been having. So we believe these dormant season burns, we call them. Dormant season just means January to March, you know, before the main growing season. We call that dormant season or winter burn. The growing season or summer burns are August and September. And we think these have really different kinds of results to the plant. We believe that we need to do some more work to see if these dormant season burns actually promote flowering because in this area, all we've been having is summer burns. 
And in fact, this is the kind of data, I'm not going to bore you with all this stuff, but I just want to show you we're acquiring data over time, all the way back to 2001 in these plots. And we're monitoring drought, we're monitoring percent flowering, we're looking at dormant season versus growing season burns and seeing what's going on. And you can see this one's been dropping off. And this is some of that encroachment that we've been seeing, but we also want to see if we can get a dormant season burn in here that might promote the flowering. So just to show you encroachment in another one, this is in 2018. There's our transect. When this transect was first put in, these bushes weren't there. And so that year, 2018, after we did our counts, they went in and did a summer burn in August. There's the same pole in the yellow arrow, and there's Dale standing there at the other end. And you see that the fire did not get into the whole plot. We needed to move further into the Pocosin area. But 2018 was kind of a wild year, right? Everybody remember 2018? 101 inches of rainfall here. So it was pretty wet, and that's part of the reason why the burn didn't get in there. So let me just compare. In 2023, when we went out and did our work, you can see the area is covered. Half of the plot area is covered with these shrubs. But you know what happened in June? We had the wildfire. This is the same plot as that. So see all of these shrubs, all that was killed by the wildfire right there. So we're hoping this year that we'll see a change in this plot with numbers. So that's important for us to see. All right, let's move to our state carnivorous plant the Venus flytrap. And I wanted to show you the importance of fire for that one as well. So following the burn that occurred uh, in May of last year in uh, Big Island, that was 6-6. Six, six. So what was that? About you know, 15 days after the burn. You see those little green things? That's the Venus flytrap. So they're already starting to come back. I'm going to show you a sequence. So this is the end of that month, so another 20 days. See how big it's gotten? <laughs> I say big. You know, it's a, it's big's relative. So. But all of these are plants coming up too. So there it is in July, September. You can see the healthy modified lease to catch the bugs. And then this particular one, you can see well, it looks like it's starting to change. And it turns out, you see these blacks? Those are some of the leaves that are dying back. They don't go dormant in the winter, but they do reduce back. And so what you can see on January, see all these black pieces? All oh, those were former leaves that are there. Now, of course, those leaves will die off anyway because one of the things that happens when they catch a bug, you know, they close up and they catch the bug and digest it and then about seven to 10 days later, it opens up again. It does that about three times and then kind of falls off. The other thing that happens with that though, if I have a drought condition, that whole thing will brown out, but then it'll come back. It doesn't die, it just browns out. So that's what we're looking at. And so let me give you a quick history of fly traps. All the way back, Arthur Dobbs, the governor, said how unusual it was and unique it was. And Charles Darwin, by the way, Charles Darwin was a good geologist. He wasn't just a good biologist, too. <laughs> so Charles Darwin, one of the most wonderful plants in the world, he actually wrote a book on insectivorous plants. <coughs> Protected by legislation, designated the state carnivorous plant. And then in 2016, there was a petition to list Venus flytraps as a federally endangered species. So what is it right now? In the U.S. federal system, it's a species of concern. In North Carolina, it's listed as threatened. Okay? But the goal of some of these guys was to say, you know, this thing is really threatened. We need to actually get it on the federal endangered species list to protect it. So this was the petition that went before um, Fish and Wildlife to be able to say, you know, let's protect this. And the reason they wanted to protect it was they were concerned about habitat loss, habitat quality, overexploitation, and poaching. 
existing regulations that before 2013 was a misdemeanor. It's like a slap on the wrist that they caught you with a poached plant. We kind of changed that going into 2014 with the felony rule, as I'll mention. And other things like climate change and sea level, loss of habitat, connectivity that we've got. So all of these things are really important to us to look at. So in 2020, so that you could address some of this issue, Plant Heritage Group of North Carolina said, well, let's see if we can do an assessment of the number of plants. So there was over 20 people, we were included in this, 20 people going out to different places to count plants and establish a number. Because as it was estimated in some literature, it was only 35,000 plants left in the wild. People working on it knew that wasn't the case. This was something that people threw out there, but there was always a lot more than that. So in looking at this, what they did was we came up with a list of about 500,000 Venus flytraps in southeastern coastal plain. Okay? But I'm going to tell you, there's probably close to that in the green swamp, because the green swamp is the nexus of flytraps. So 2023, U.S. Fish and Wildlife said, because of this and other reasons, we don't think it warrants listing it on the federal list. So it's going to stay as it is, threatening North Carolina species concern. And we thought it might be good to put it on threatened but not endangered because it's not at risk of being lost in the foreseeable future, which is the definition of an endangered species. Okay? So how did we come up with some of the numbers? Well, I'm just going to show you a quickie. We counted them. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't count all these things. I mean, you'd be there for five years. But what you can do is you can do some estimates. And so this is an acre and a half of savanna. It's one of the smallest ones. So what you can do is you can count every flowering plant in there, which takes a while, but you can do it. And then what you can say is I've got plots that show to me that, you know, let's say 25% or 50% of those plants are flowering. So if you count the flowers in the entire area, then you can deduce, you know, what would be the number. So in a case of 10,000 flowers that we counted one year in this, the flower percent, 34, so you actually take that, and you can come up, there's 31,000 plants in that one, one and a half acre area, okay? So this isn't quantitative data, it's qualitative to semi-quantitative data. So you can't take it to invest in the bank, but it gives you a good idea of what's actually there. And so we did this in lots of the ones. So historically, all of these areas had Venus flytraps to about 90 miles. But in this map, you can show, you can see ones that used to be historic, which are no longer there. And you can see the ones that are present. And these numbers are what we call element occurrences. And you see Brunswick County has more than anybody else. And the richest of the rich is the green swamp right there. But all of these large refugia areas, we call them these protected areas, are so important like Croatan, Camp Lejeune, Holly Shelter, Green Swamp, and to a degree, Boiling Spring Lakes and Military Ocean Terminal. Terminal, All of those have lots of rich flowers, and I mean plants in them. So how's that for data? So <laughs> I'm going to quickly move from that. That's the data that we've collected on Venus flytraps, but there's a couple of more tables. There was a whiz with Excel. So let me show you the actual results of what all those numbers mean. The numbers mean in grass density, density impact, as I get more and more grass, the size of the plant and the number of flowers are going to reduce. They get really stressed out. So this will be an area where we burned in early part of the year, and you can see the grass isn't so thick. In this particular one, but you don't see any flowers either. In this one, it was burned in August, and so in this particular case, the following year, all of those are Venus flytrap flowers. So that's what we're saying here, increased flowering the year after a growing season burn, and big plants but little flowering following a dormant season burn, and then I'm going to show you the rest of these things with poaching quickly as well. So let me show you this picture. This is in Big Island. There's our transect, and there's the quadrat. So we get down there and count. 
And by the way, this is the only picture in 20 years of me in the green swamp. <laughs> I, had, I had to beg Dale to take a picture of me <laughs> to show people that I was actually out there doing something. So she's in all the pictures usually because I'm taking the pictures. But anyway, you're digging away at this thing, and all those are plants. Every one of those yellow arrows is pointing to a plant. And look how thick that grass is. Not a flower in sight, and they're all going from this size after a burn to this kind of size. They're stressing. <laughs> okay. So look at this one. This particular one, the burn was in February, and we got these four plots there. Total plants in that area, and look, kind of low flowering. But you can see in this particular case, you know, that there's not as much grass, and so lots of good plants, you know, in size. By the way, that's the same knife in every picture you'll see. <laughs> so following that year, there was a 50% jump in plant flowering the next year. And so one last one just to show you. This was a, in Little Island. So we were looking at this particular one, doing our counts in 2018. There was an August burn the previous year. Look at all the flowers. So a 60% increase in flowering because of that burn and large plants. And we couldn't get a burn in here for lots of reasons. And so we said, well, could we do some kind of mechanical just to see what would happen? So they went out there with trimmers and trimmed this area. Notice the difference in there versus here. See all the green? So it turns out that in removing that, we removed some of the stressors, and it turned out that the following year, this was, you know, the 2020. You can see there wasn't a whole lot of flowering. The next year, all the flowering went up, but in particular, those two plot areas that we manually cut, the flowering went way up. And that's because you removed the stressor of all the flowers the previous year. So, this is a picture, all of you heard about the risk of poaching. And in poaching, what you can see here in 2014, we have a felony rule now. It turned out that nobody was really prosecuted with that until the summer of 2016. So I wanted to show you a couple of things with this. Everything in red is severely poached. These are all our plots. Orange, as you can see, is moderate poaching. Look in 2013. 2014 all the way to 2016, and with the exception of some breads that I, I can mention, but following 2016, things have gotten better. It wasn't until they did the prosecution in the summer of 2016 that some of the message got out. But you may have heard something last night. So yesterday, they found these two guys, and they were in Boiling Springs, 590 plants were poached in Boiling Spring Lakes. So it is still occurring, but it actually has reduced, we believe, kind of dramatically following that. And if they actually prosecute the guys here, that'll be another warning. Now why is this one, though, continuing to be poached? This area continues to be poached because it's easy to get to, but it's not visible from the road. So. We see that one all the time. In fact, Nature Conservancy, you go out there, be careful what you do because we're putting game cams out there. <laughs> I don't want anything going on out there. So. so, just to show you some of the poaching, in 2013, we did this quadrat right there. It's a one by three meter quadrat. There's 136 plants. The next year we went out there, it had been poached. There were 27 plants left. And this area has been so severely run over that all those big, see all those big plants and flowering? They don't flower much anymore. They're all small plants. They just have never recovered in that. This is the difference between a small plot area and a really big refugia area where you have thousands of plants. In this particular plot area, taking 100 plants is really serious. Taking 100 plants, Bad as it is, it's not near as bad if I've got 20,000 plants out there. They have a chance to recover more. It still should be a felony, but you know there is a difference in those. And it turns out that most of our plant areas are in these smaller areas. 
It's just those big ones that are so valuable to ensure the continuation of healthy long leaf uh, Venus flytrap. So one of the reasons that some people were looking at poaching, uh, it was considered that they were good for a cure. Of course, people think everything's a cure, right? Uh, so this is some Venus flytrap oil. It's an herbal extract that's there. And it's been looked at for these things. So Venus flytraps, pharma, you know, has some stuff. And so one of the things in Venus flytraps is you saw that trap that was shutting in the picture a while ago. It's eating a fly, right? Well, that's actually very low on the totem pole. Flies are actually fifth on the hit list for what they eat because you can see what's in there and they've been eaten. Spiders, ants, beetles, crickets, and so it should have been the spider plant. I guess we already got a spider plant though, right? <laughs> so anyway, if you look at that, I always tell people, this is one of my favorites, uh, say if you want to have some entertainment when you got nothing better to do, read some comments of people, you know, when they make comments about products. And this is one of my all-time favorites. So good product. Husband takes this to boost his immune system. Does a great job for him. His psoriasis is completely cleared up. The only problem is he says it tastes like flies. <laughs> so, and so obviously it didn't taste like flies because they ate these things. And it's good for your dog too because it removed his tumor. So anyway, a, a cure-all plant. The other thing, just to briefly, because I know I'm running out of time, so probably have run out of time, but anyway, this is important. NC State did a study, and you know, we, we saw this guy several times ourselves, but what the state study said was that what they eat is not what pollinates them. That's a pretty good idea, right? <laughs> and so what you find down here, the things that are eating, the ones I just showed you, are different than what's up here. So there's a green sweat bee, and then there's my longhorn beetle. Those things are doing their pollination stuff and then down here. These don't have a big root system. It's like a little rhizome down below the ground. That's why it's easy to poach. You can just take a, I shouldn't tell you how to do this. <laughs> I, I can take a spoon and I can just pop it out of the ground. And that's what, that's what they can do. So to conclude, so I don't take you too long, um, celebrate the tree. A bottom line that we've been looking at is to think about what is the best management restoration strategies. And of course, since burning is so important, is to come up with a regime that optimizes both the plants and the wildlife. So the kind of strategy that we come up with is to have like a 30 month burn cycle. And so what we would do if we wouldn't burn for these two years, then we'd do a January to March burn the next year you wouldn't burn, you'd wait until the growing season burned for 2028. That gets us a 30 month rotation in each one of those cycles. So why is that important? It gives you an opportunity for multiple different kinds of species to optimize, you know, with those different kinds of burns. I just showed you the idea of the flowering in different seasonality burns. Also the health of those plants, but it's not just those two or the longleaf pine, because they always say you can have a quadrat and you can have 40 or 50 plants in that quadrat. Making sure that you have this kind of a burn cycle optimizes all the other plants, the herbaceous grass layer as well that's in there. And the other thing that we don't want to do is you don't want to burn everything at the same time. You want to burn this savanna, next year you burn that savanna, savanna on the 30 year, 30 month cycle because the critters, the insects, you know, can move from this one when it's burning over to the other one. And then they can quickly repopulate that other savanna that's just been burned. So all of this has lots of reasons to try to do this. And just look at that picture. I mean, that looks like somebody's gone out there and mowed the grass. That is a natural occurrence in the savanna area. And that's just, that's a great picture to me. And I'm going to leave it with that for the thing.